Elon Musk has been trying for months to make Twitter a profitable company, but he's had a lot of ups and downs along the way. The brief reign so far of billionaire Elon Musk at Twitter has unleashed a wave of tumult throughout the company. Twitter is reportedly laying off about half of its 7,500 employees today. He's saying, hey, new ownership, I'm in charge. Uh, and things are going to be very different. He owns Twitter. He paid $44 billion for it. And the only question is, what is its future? What is its future? That's the question that everyone has been asking, including Musk, who has been trying to figure out the answer in real time with the entire internet watching. Musk has proposed all kinds of changes and strategies since taking over the company, from firing and then rehiring and then firing more Twitter employees, to getting people to pay $8 for the privilege of having a check mark next to their name, to most recently offering to share ad revenue with Twitter Blue paid subscribers. Musk also endorsed the release of The Twitter Files, a series of tweet threads by reporters he brought in to demonstrate exactly how the company was run before he took over. The thrust of the Twitter files, that Twitter was biased against conservative points of view and unnecessarily censored stories in the name of public safety, were the reasons that he gave for becoming chief twit in the first place, even if he did initially spend months trying to back out of the deal. I don't care about the economics at all. Musk took the role of CEO thinking of Twitter as a broken product that needed fixing, not a stable investment that could be left in its current form. For everyone watching since then, the chaos at Twitter has provided a window into how social media companies like this actually work and whether their business model is sustainable in the long term. Think of Twitter as a high school cafeteria. The way to get people to come to the platform is to have content, to have drama there that people don't want to miss. That's why Twitter and other social media companies have made business decisions to generate and amplify content that, as Elon Musk might imply, makes Twitter a more entertaining place than Netflix. Take the December Twitter spat between Andrew Tate and Greta Thunberg, which, according to Twitter's now public view counts, has been seen over 300 million times. A famous Swedish climate activist dunking on a masculine provocateur by questioning his manhood is a dream scenario for a company that makes its business off of user engagement. In a broader sense, it's not a productive conversation. It's not going to meaningfully impact climate policy, and it's certainly not helping to improve political discourse. Yet any tweet that can single-handedly drive an entire news cycle and then continue to generate viral content afterwards will appeal to Twitter executives. So is this good for society? No. But is this good for Twitter? A social media company like Twitter needs to appeal to users and advertisers. Twitter needs to maximize people's time on the site so they'll see as many ads as possible. Ads which, according to Twitter's 2021 filings, accounted for 89% of the company's revenue. Musk now wants to move Twitter away from that advertising model, but until he can do that, Twitter is still working within this more views, more ads framework. That's why any discussion about the content on Twitter is also a discussion of the way Twitter itself was designed to work. And figuring out where Twitter goes in the future involves understanding the design choices it's made in the past. According to the engineers who made them, the retweet and quote tweet buttons exist to give people the chance to spread hot takes quickly and then dunk on the people who made them. It's also why Twitter often inserts what it calls relevant or popular tweets into people's feeds. Tweets that aren't from anyone you personally are following, but are getting a lot of engagement on the platform. But this approach to incentivize hot takes as much as possible can be a double-edged sword for drumming up advertisers. A cutting tweet from Elon Musk about Dr. Fauci might get 1.2 million likes on the platform, but that same tweet might cause an advertiser to reconsider whether they want to spend anything on Twitter at all. People on Twitter are rewarded for inflating their rhetoric, for using charged rhetoric and uh, hurling accusations at each other. You know, careful consensus building exercise are not generally rewarded by, I would say the algorithm, but really rewarded by other users. People like fireworks, we like drama, we like, you know, the, the, the real housewives of Twitter. <laughs> you know, that's, uh, we're kind of up against human nature in a kind of social media world. So what do you do? You know, advertisers like certainty and steadiness, people like messy drama. Um, I, if you figure out the answer to that, I, I expect Elon Musk will have a job for you, you know, <laughs> figuring out strategy for the next year or two. Advertisers like certainty and people like drama. Elon Musk has addressed this tension by shaming the advertisers leaving Twitter. But Twitter's old management argued that it isn't a question of how a hot take goes viral. It's a question of which ones. 
Back in 2018, former Twitter CEO Jack Dorsey was called before Congress to discuss transparency and accountability at the company. And during the hearing, he was specifically asked whether Twitter shadow banned the accounts of prominent conservatives and Republicans on the platform. I want to read a few quotes about Twitter's practices, and I just want you to tell me if they're true or not. Uh, social media is being rigged to censor conservatives. Is that true of Twitter? No. Twitter shadow banning prominent Republicans. Bad. Is that true? No. The exchange you just watched was later used by the congressman asking the questions, Representative Mike Doyle, to call the idea that Twitter was censoring conservatives a load of crap. And in a blog post from 2018, Twitter went even further, clarifying exactly what it meant. People are asking us if we shadow ban. We do not. But let's start with what is shadow banning? The best definition we found is this, deliberately making someone's content undiscoverable to everyone except the person who posted it unbeknownst to the original poster. We do not shadow ban. That blog post is worth noting because on the one hand, it says something incredibly direct, we don't shadow ban. But if you read it again, you'll see that it uses very specific language that gives Twitter a lot of leeway to do anything short of secretly making someone's tweets invisible to all other users. A specific example here might be somewhat helpful. Take Libs of TikTok, a popular right-leaning account that became famous for reposting TikTok videos of people making incendiary comments about gender theory and LGBT issues. The account is controversial. Its creator, for example, helped drive negative coverage of a children's hospital in Boston after she secretly recorded employees from the hospital discussing performing gender-affirming surgeries on minors. Yet even though Twitter specifically admitted the account did not engage in behavior violative of its hateful conduct policy, it still took punitive action against libs of TikTok anyways, subjecting it to six temporary suspensions and a trending blacklist, meaning that libs of TikTok could never trend regardless of how many likes or views an individual tweet got. Libs of TikTok was using Twitter the way Twitter wants to be used, reposting crazy videos that got lots of views and even coverage in the Washington Post and New York Times yet Twitter still blacklisted the account. What I found very interesting is we assume who are outside of the social media companies, they must have algorithms. It must be like, you know, adjusting the dials, right? Um, but there still is an enormous amount of these companies rely on human beings to do a lot of the content moderation. And then if for the very big accounts, the most controversial, it goes to this at least before on Twitter, it was, you know, the, the senior executives at the company would make these decisions. So, you know, this is a point that Matt Taibbi and Barry Weiss and others have made, but it, it stands in my view from the Twitter files, which is that when everybody at your company is a coastal progressive type, you don't really have, you know, it's hard for you to even understand where your biases might be when you're making those decisions. When Elon Musk bought Twitter, he claimed he was purchasing a non-profit that was more dedicated to social influence than profit, and he believed that Twitter was fundamentally an activist organization, according to Barry Weiss, one of the authors of the Twitter files. It's not an unfounded claim. According to Open Secrets, over 99.5% of all political donations by Twitter employees went to Democrats in 2022. And Joel Roth, Twitter's former head of trust and safety, specifically said that when it came to content moderation decisions involving libs of TikTok and Christian satire sites like the Babylon Bee, Yeah, not only is it not funny, but it is dangerous and it does contribute to an environment that makes people unsafe in the world. So let's start from a premise that it's f***ed up. Now, to be clear, Musk bought Twitter on the premise that the hypocritical way it punished some accounts for operating according to Twitter's own business model was bad. But Musk himself has tweeted that freedom of speech doesn't mean freedom of reach, and that negative hate tweets will be max deboosted and demonetized. So even Elon Musk is making a distinction between freedom of reach and freedom of speech, which will be hard to maintain on a platform which prioritizes getting content out to as many people as possible and promotes the ones that do. It's like the director of a Broadway show promising the audience more content from the most popular actors, but then cutting their microphones midway through the performance. Don't be surprised if some of the audience members want a refund. Funds. People might have a lot of different opinions about what Twitter is and what it should be, but as Elon Musk himself has said, he might not always get it right, but these are important questions to be thinking actively about. Twitter has become kind of the de facto town square, um, so uh, it, it, it's just really important that people have the, both the, uh, the reality and the perception uh, that they are able to speak freely within the bounds of the law. My, my, strong intuitive sense is that 
uh, having a public platform that is maximally trusted um, and, 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 and broadly inclusive um, is extremely important to the future of civilization.